Okay. Well, hi, folks. Um, we're we're just at the top of the hour, so um, welcome welcome to open call. I think we'll we'll kind of get started a little slowly in case other people hop on over the next few minutes. But um, <laughs> thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, we uh, so so today, when what we're trying to do is talk a little bit about um, tools for responding to disasters, specifically ones that help us to um, sort of collect environmental data and prepare us for sort of responding to whatever environmental issues that are coming up. So we've been kind of calling it um, our environmental disaster response toolkit. Um, and this is this is certainly something that kind of Venn diagrams into all different kinds of disaster response that will be framing um, today's conversation just a little bit around um, things that we need to do to be prepared to cope with, with the environmental side of things. So if you take a look, um, we have a couple links in the chat to a place where we are going to be taking notes. So um, in that link, and um, you know, we'll share it, share it out after the call as well. Um, there are places if you have resources that you want to kind of add to the list or um, questions or topics that you think um, we should cover, that is a good place to hop in. Um, for anything that, you know, may kind of um, sort of go off in another direction, we do have another call tomorrow. It's an open call, so we can also use tomorrow's call as a time to either um, continue this conversation or kind of pay attention to topics that we may not um, have time to address today. So, um, with that said, I'd love to go around and do some introductions, and I'm just going to kind of go around in a circle the way that I see people. So, um, Jeff, do you want to you go first? Sure. I'm Jeff. I live in Providence, Rhode Island, but I'll be joining the barn raising, and I work with the kids team uh, at Public Lab, and um, I um, like to make things possible from cheaper, more household, like easy to find parts uh, when it comes to kit stuff. Um, and then I myself am in the next square. So I'm Bronwyn. I'm on the staff at Public Lab. I also work on the kit team. Um, what I especially want to know today is what folks, um, what folks want to have access to when we go to Houston to start talking about um, tools that, that can be useful in, in all of this. So um, if there are things that you use or things that you're curious about or things that you have questions about, um, now is a great time to mention all of them because we'll do what we can to have something in Houston for you to look at. Um, okay. uh, Liz is next. Um, hi, I'm Liz. I'm calling in from Brooklyn, actually right across the table from Bronwyn, which is great. And um, <clears throat> uh, I'm on staff at Public Lab and I helped organize last summer's crisis convening with really a, an incredible group of co-organizers. And I'm happy to support that theme uh, moving forward as we look ahead towards Galveston. Um, and I'm happy for this call um, to get to meet people, some of whom, some of you may be coming to Galveston, we, we may be meeting you for the first time. Um, some of you won't be able to, which just makes your contributions um, all that much more valuable at this stage. So um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. And so Ashley, I see you next. <laughs> Hey, hi everyone. I'm Ashley. I'm calling in from Ecuador and um, I'm joining the call because, um, well, living in Ecuador, um, there's a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of earthquake activity, and so this theme kind of interests me to learn more about um, the toolkits that are available and um, it just felt like something that I would want to learn more about. and. Um, and especially given what just happened in, in Brazil with the dam breaking, it just, I don't know, motivated me even more just to be part of that conversation. So thank you. And I look forward to just listening and learning. Okay, thanks. 
And for those of you who just tapped on, we're just going around and quickly introducing ourselves. So I will sort of call on folks as I see your name or number on the list. Um, so Danielle is next. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm in Southern California and I am uh, studying environmental toxicology um, and I'm doing a, a, a fellowship with Public Lab right now to help develop some resources for folks to test their soil um, for soil contamination. Happy to be here. Okay. And Sean? Yes, thanks, Bronwyn. This is Sean Crawford. Um, right now I'm in Birmingham, Alabama, which is my home base. I've um, been working with Jackie James Creedon in Tonawanda, New York, uh, regarding the Coke facility up there that uh, supposedly reduced, uh, produced uh, toxic emissions into the neighborhood. Um, but basically, uh, I'm an industrial hygienist. I have a lot of background in multiple exposures from multiple media, such as water and air. But what we have been focusing on is our uh, soil sampling toolkit, which is uh, something that we put together. It fits in a five gallon bucket and it can be used by citizens or anyone to uh, go out and collect soil samples post disaster um, in a very controlled, you know, uh, EPA methodology type way to uh, send those soil samples off to a partner lab that we, we partnered with, Best America. And uh, we have a, a citizen science uh, analytical rate so they can look for whatever they suspect to be in the residual soil after, say, a flood or something, uh, from dioxins to uh, PAH, some heavy metals and, and whatnot. So, but I wanted to join in today just to see what else was out there and how we could help. Great. Excellent. Um, so next is actually also Sean, Sean McGinnis. Hey all, Sean McGinnis here. Uh, so I joined this call when I saw the message around developing the dis uh, disaster response toolkits. Um, one of the hats I wear is working with nonprofit and non governmental organizations in response to disasters, whether that be humanitarian disasters, uh, weather disasters, etc., and trying to help understand what people's needs are, what tools are out there, and how to align like the best tools to support the people and the different roles that they play in the disaster response process. Great. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, and Dan, Dan Beavers, you're next. Okay. Uh, I uh, am a, a volunteer with the Red Cross. Uh, I'm right now, I'm, I'm retired, uh, live in Picayune, Mississippi. And Red Cross does disaster response, but uh, its uh, focus is on alleviating human suffering. Uh, so, and that's about it. Awesome. Um, and Brian Deli. Um, Brian, um, if you want to say hello, um, you can unmute yourself or I can unmute you. And... All right. So, um, Brian, hop back in if you like, and we will move on to Jose. Did you say Chose? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, sure. sorry, sorry. Uh, this is Jose Quiroga from Barcelona, and we've been working in the INBEC project about investigating uh, a couple of landfills here. And I'm interested in kits, toolkits, and archiving and putting things together. So, uh, yes, I'm here to listen, basically. Great. Good to have you. All right, Jackie, you're next. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm actually on the phone and I'm on a new computer. So I can see on my computer and I'm talking into my phone. So I think <laughs> this is gonna work because <laughs> I couldn't get the microphone working on the computer. But anyways, I'm here. 
Um, are we just introducing ourselves? Yes. Okay, um, I'm Jackie James Creedon. I'm from Tonawanda, New York, and I work with Sean, and we've created a soil sampling toolkit. And I did hear Sean um, on there before, and he described on what the kit's about, and we're very excited about it. Um, we'll be uh, attending barn raising at the end of this month. Um, Evan is going to be there, so um, we're just excited about uh, this opportunity. Great. Um, looking forward to having having you there in person. Um, so the next person um, I'm looking at has a 917 phone number. That's me. This is Wendy Pereira. I'm in New York, and um, I'm with Green Map. Um, we I've been looking a bit on the mobility side of um, <clears throat> faster response. And Green Map is also part of LES Ready, which is a coalition of about 50 community-based organizations on the Lower East Side, which has at LES Ready put up some related resources. Oh, fantastic. Hi, um, uh, all right, so then the, the next person is calling in on the phone from an 832 phone number. And whoever it is with an 832, um, can just jump in and say hello or else. We will move on to the next and last square that I'm looking at. It's somebody also calling in from a 716 phone number. Oh, that's me. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. That's Jackie. Hi, yeah, Jackie. that's what I, I'm, I'm, all right. yeah, I'm on too. <laughs> I, I, I recognize the area code, but all right. Okay, so. Yeah, you should. I did. Um, all right, uh, fantastic. Well, welcome and, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I know that um, Wendy, you know, some, some of us were together in Newark earlier, earlier this year while we were talking about kind of a, a broad or broader approach to environmental disaster and disaster response. Um, and, you know, we came up with, with a lot of resources there. Um, and some of those resources are linked in, um, in our open hour um, link on the pad. So we've put the, the link in the chat a couple of times. But um, after this call, anytime that anybody sort of suggests uh, a website or something that you know you might want folks to take a look at, um, either add them to the chat or add them to the the pad link and we'll we'll get everything together so people can, can check back in afterwards. Um, but if you do have access to to the talk um, page. We have a little bit of, of an outline there and some, some question prompts. Um, so, so again, we're, we're really thinking about tools and methods that we can use to gather um, information about environmental impact. Um, one of the things we know is that there are organizations and government agencies that are tasked with um, sort of surveying and um, you know, remediating when there is an event, but we also know that these agencies and organizations are not always um, great at their timeline for response. They don't always sort of come up with the kind of response that a community needs. Um, and so we're sort of talking about ways that we can also fill in the gaps when we're being affected by some kind of issue and um, ways that we can prepare to do our, our own advocacy sort of in the absence of somebody else just showing up and um, doing, doing all that for us. So um, I'm curious, and, and folks can kind of um, ping in as, you know, as you have things to say, but we, if, if you're not able to see the checklist right now, um, I'll just sort of put all these, these bullet points that, that I have out, out there for folks to start thinking about, and we can add more too. Um, one of them is to think about pre-planning, so things things that you might want to do or have now before a disaster happens, so that you may um, have things on hand when you need them, so that you may have the ability to compare pre and post-disaster information, um, and 
you know, we're all going to be thinking about Houston and um, focusing a little bit on flood and storm events. But, you know, these are all going to be things that may be a little bit different depending on sort of where you are and the timeline of the disasters that you either have responded to or anticipate, you know, maybe an issue. Um, we're going to we sort of touch on best practices for, for health and safety. So, you know, where, where is a good time to kind of jump in and grab a sample and where is definitely not a good time to do that thing because we don't want people um, getting hurt. Um, we're going to be thinking about what kind of real-time data is meaningful to collect. So, photo documentation of things, you know, as they're happening, which may sometimes be your only chance to kind of identify a, a source of a contaminant, um, what kinds of things can wait, um, what kind of data collection tools you, you use, what you think you might want to use, um, anything that you're curious about. Um, and then we'll sort of touch on remediation and recovery, you know, what is, what is sort of the long post-disaster response um, and what are the things to note if you anticipate a need to pursue legal or regulatory enforcement. Um, so <laughs> with, with that, um, <laughs> with, with that, it's a lot, but I know that not everybody can, can see the notes, so I just wanted to make sure that we um, put them out there. Um, with that, I'm going to kind of go around, I think, down that list somewhat in order. Um, so if, if folks want to kind of ping in at all on, um, Either events that you've experienced and um, what, you know, if you're in a place where you anticipate regular floods or regular storms, um, are, there, are there things that you would have in your pre-planning kit, um, things that you wish that you had pre-planned for, um, questions like that. And so if you just, um, we'll, we'll kind of try and keep a list of people who are talking and take stacks, but if you just want to give a little wave, we can, and I know those of you on the phone can't wave, but just say hey, um, and we'll, we'll get you on a list. Sean. Well, can I, I'll just start okay. real quick. So, so, I, you know, wait one second, we do have two Sean's, so I will be more specific oh. in the future, but Sean, keep talking, and Sean McGinnis, you're next. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry about this. No, that's okay. No, Tano Anderson. Um, oh. You can go. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So, well, I mean, I was just thinking, like, from a flood and disaster standpoint. I know mean, this is all generality. Um, I remember, like, with the Houston floods, there were some uh, facilities that caught fire, and then there was residual water, and then after that, what was left in the soil. So. I, from a planning purpose, I mean, first of all, if, if, I, if there's a disaster, what I want to look for first is uh, contaminants in air because they're probably going to last from minutes to hours, just mm -hmm. depending on what the source is. And then I would want to focus on water contamination after that because that could be hours to days. Mm -hmm. And then once the water recedes, then I would be concerned about what's in the soil and what, what residual from uh, contamination sources that could be identified as having been there in the water and perhaps mm -hmm. in the water prior to that. But, um, you know, for me, what, a, what I'd want to know is uh, where are the sources of contamination? You know, so in a pre-planning package, I'd want to have like, knowledge of all the refineries and chemical companies and uh, oil distributors and whatnot that were around and in my location and uh, so I could plan on what contaminants might be in the air, soil, and water after a disaster. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's there could all, almost be like a pre pre-disaster response work, right? Right, well, if I live, like, just to take an example, so Mount Dioxin down in Florida, it's a, 
It's basically a EPA secret fund site where they've mounted uh, tons and tons of dioxin contaminated soil and put them under parts. And so, just as using that as an example, if I was living nearby, Sean, I'm going to interrupt you really quickly because you just you, you you're a little muffled. I don't know if you can just hold your phone. Oh. On. Okay, sorry. But uh, I would want to be able to, you know, identify if any of my options came off the the landfill and so got into my soil on my property uh, via the water and the flood or something like that. Yeah, this is Reverend Caldwell. Um, my office is in here. First of all, I want to welcome everyone who's coming to my state <laughs> uh, from all over the country and all over the world. So welcome, and we look forward to seeing you here. But I oh. kind of all agree with Sean. Um, what we don't have in place here, and most of you know what has happened, uh, you know, in Houston and, of course, Gavis in Southeast Texas as a result of COVID. But there was no, and there are no, uh, real early uh, warning of the Texas system when it comes to uh, environmental issues and hazards. We're talking about chemical plants, or we're talking about Superfund sites, and things of that nature, when, especially when uh, disaster uh, such as Harvey uh, occurred, and the frequency of something like that occurred in Southeast Texas, or anywhere along the Gulf Coast, for that matter, um, is prevalent. And we have discovered that as a result of Harvey, there is not really, uh, there were several uh, spills and uh, uh, fires as a result of, of, uh, of Harvey itself. And that was really nothing other than stay in place uh, measure for safety for communities in and around uh, these particular areas. Having an early warning system and a system in place for evacuation should that be necessary and also mm. you know the health aspect of it all of the above are issues that uh, we notice that needs to have some attention drawn to okay. yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense um, in in so your your estimation were were there any tools that would i mean are there, are there any things that you can think of that would have helped? folks communicate with each other better around around what what needed to happen after the cells or during the cells um, in especially in an evacuation scenario oh and I do see that that Sean Sean is next anyway to speak and he's raising his hand so Sean go ahead hey all um, so in, in thinking about it from the pre-planning process, and if we're going to talk about the storm type events and what kind of uh, predictive or, or tools like that that are going to start to estimate areas of impact, um, there are a lot of data sources that are already out there that identify flood inundation areas and they start coming, they start being made publicly available usually about four to five days before storms touch ground or before they hit land. So this is open data that's usually coming from NOAA and uh, FEMA. So they start putting that information out early. Now thinking about it in response from a couple big storms wearing a couple different hats, some of the things I want to understand is overlap of populations with that storm inundation area, land cover within that storm inundation area, as well as, um, as uh, Sean had brought up, hazardous sites. Now, this is where it kind of gets a little fuzzy and depends on your, your geographic area. Um, a lot of states do make their permitted facility data publicly available. So you can have access to geographic information around publicly permitted um, data beforehand. So you'll have an understanding of where are the big places like the oil refineries, like the Superfund sites, et cetera, but also access to some of the smaller ones, dry cleaners, gas stations, things like that. Those are permitted facilities as well. 
So these are things that in thinking about it in a pre-planning, going out to the environmental quality agencies for whatever geography that you're working with, and either they have it publicly available or it's um, sunshineable or foyable or something like that to get access to permitted facility information. So those are some of the things that, that I work, work to try and understand, those being the three big ones. You know, what's the extent which gets updated? Um, usually, like during, during Harvey, I believe the storm inundation area was being updated every four hours with estimated inundation zones. Um, they do have population info that's either coming from census or in certain areas, you've got actual property boundaries and information with descriptors of the properties as well. And then finally, those, those sensitive uh, hazardous areas. So from a pre-plan at kind of like a high, high level, I, I start in like thinking to catalog those data sets and then start trickling down to the finer grained data sets that may be more regional or geographically specific. And then to some of the other points, you know, soils data, there's, and this is speaking United States wide. So I understand it's not a global, but soils information, because now you start to understand, uh, you know, how things can, uh, you know, leach into the soil, depending on the soil type, land cover, all of that stuff. Oh, sorry, Ashley is next. Yeah, one thing that just came to mind as I was listening to Sean speak was um, in, in terms of, I guess, like the, the spread of the impact area and who would be impacted is maybe also identifying vulnerable communities within that um, impact area of like who, who might not have the resources to evacuate or I don't know. Um, that's just something that came to mind and I know it was an issue during Harvey too. Yeah, the, the population characteristics are very important. You're right. Uh, this is, <clears throat> this is Jeff. Uh, I, uh, so it's some, I guess some of the things that we've seen people uh, work on in different from different sides and different you know different projects and so forth are like uh, there's the I'm trying to get the name of it the oil and gas uh, threat map and oil and gas threat map com it's pretty interesting because it, it tries to calculate like a half mile from any oil and gas facility for any anywhere in the nation um, and and show like you know what facilities are near you and and so forth um, and and that's also Frack Tracker in general. Uh, the Frack Tracker Alliance has a lot of really good data. Um, you know, they they sort of release it in chunks rather than having one map that's always perpetually updated. But one thing we've been trying to do is draw in some of that data, draw in data from the toxic release inventory, which is not great, but at least it, you know it's some some data, um, and then from other sources, and just have them appear on the same map um, so that you can cross reference and not have to sort of have back and forth between two maps um, and the one of the issues we've had is that there's just like a lot of well there's like a lot of data and there's not a lot of data right there's obviously a lot of gaps most of maybe most most things are not mapped right like in terms of sets or but but also even even with just the stuff that say you know is industry self-reporting which is not even that not even that great data and like some of these other layers from frack tracker and so forth it starts to really fill up your screen and, and it's hard to hard to see the things because they're overlapping. So we're trying to figure out, we have a project called Leaflet Environmental Layers to try to work on that a little bit and just show them together, but not make it useful. Um, and, and the only reason I mentioned that in particular based on what Ashley said was um, we, we uh, also included as one of the layers, uh, uh, the justice map, which is really awesome and it has demographic information. Uh, I think it, based on looking at the map, it looks like it just goes down to about zip code level. So it's not, it's not great resolution, but I think, you know, with regard to like these impacting communities of color in particular, and especially heavily, like that kind of data is, it seems like pretty rarely shown 
alongside a map of like where the, the facilities are or you know like it, it's just not like the government's not providing that kind of thing and they're not making that link explicit in, in their data sources so we're trying to sort of see where that uh, is helpful there's also some layers people basically this environmental layers project is just like a giant a sandwich of layers you can just add as many layers as you want into it and it quickly becomes too many too much data but people have added for example indigenous lands uh, and the boundary the treaty boundaries and they've added um, income layers and so uh, if you go to publiclab.org slash maps or actually on the front page of mapknitter.org you can see like a pretty basic version of these layers mm -hmm. and not all of them work and like some of them don't work because the government websites are down now and some of them don't work because they're just not designed for so many people to be looking at them and some of them are broken because we had bugs in the code that we wrote because we're just trying to get this all together quick but it gives you a little bit of a sense of like some of the different sources and seeing them you know alongside each other on the same map but i know that that's like a technical solution and it's not even a very good one because like I said the interface is not that helpful but I just think it's one thing that is interesting to, to think about is that um, you know there are lots of different organizations tracking a lot of these different things but it just the ability to see them sort of next to each other as layers is, is pretty interesting and, and we're sort of curious about that as um, as one potential way to look at this information. Can I ask a clarifying question, Jeff? <clears throat> if we're looking at publiclab.org slash maps, oh, um, yeah. what do we have to click to see the other available layers? So there's like a, a, like a little sandwich icon in the upper right um, that is the layer dropdown. And then within that, there's like a lot of checkboxes. And that's what I'm really saying about the interface as well, is that like we need to do some interface design around like how do you turn on layers and there's just too many layers and they're labeled obscurely. There's just, I mean, you know, anyone who works in GIS knows this is, is a challenge. Uh, and we actually don't even have a real project around the, the interface part of this, but, but, but we, we would like to. Thanks. Good, actually, I, um, I'm gonna have Sean jump in next, but I wanna take a second for a couple of people who just hopped on the call to say hello. Um, Leslie and Emilio, you've gotten on since the last time we did some introductions. So um, Leslie, if you wanna just say hi and introduce yourself, and then Emilio, as soon as she's done, we'll, we'll say hello to you too. Uh, hey, yeah, Leslie. Um, I'm a volunteer for Public Lab, and I was interested in this work just because I was at the New Jersey conference where we talked about a lot of these issues. So I'm um, giving a shout out to those people who were there. And Emilio, I love you if you're still around. You just left, didn't you? Aww. No, 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 he's here. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, Emilio. Hi, I'm Emilio from El Salvador. I, uh, I came to the last barn racer and I am uh, trying to go to this one, so we'll see. Uh, and I, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> I'm not sure. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I work on disaster response uh, for Habitat for Humanity in El Salvador. Like, I do some things related to that. And I also have a little startup that does some work related as well. Hi. Thank you. Um, all right, Sean McGinnis, did you want to hop back in? Okay. Um, so I actually kind of want to, I, I know we're, we're kind of moving through our agenda, but I, I do want to you know, segue into, um, so we've, we've identified some, you know, assuming that we've been able to identify places that, that are vulnerable or that are experiencing or likely to experience um, contamination. Are there, Let's, let's, let's think about this in terms of the, the short term response first, maybe is, you know, are there, are there tools that are going to be helpful in um, collecting data that may not be data that you can um, grab a little bit down the road. I'll, I'll give an example of in, in New York, um, we, you know, we're, we're coastal, we get storms. Um, we also have you know, these combined sewers. So whenever they get over tapped, um, in terms of, you know, rain or flood water, they also just sort of back up uh, large cities worth of 
sewage into our bodies of water. So that um, that there's a pretty there's a pretty immediate um, cause and effect that happens. And part of the one of the, the best ways to understand which which areas are the most vulnerable um, has been to put a kite and a camera up in the air to kind of track where things are going. That's also been really useful in monitoring um, outflow from industrial sites into places that folks are not supposed to be flooding out into. Um, uh, either either in, in Houston or sort of other other places where you've lived or worked, can can you think of methods or tools that have been especially useful in that sort of day of, day after kind of investigation? Or um, I guess uh, in in the case of in the in the case of when sort of quick quick day of um, photo documentation has been of use in New York because we're we're a pretty dense space. Um, it it's been a little bit helpful or useful in terms of you know, determining who is who is accountable for for certain things. Um, so you know if there there are a bunch of industrial the facilities kind of all up against <laughs> the same body of water. It's, it's been useful to see who's 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 got the big plume coming out from them. Um, uh, I don't. Uh, I guess. Yeah. If, if anybody has sort of an example. Yeah, you know, Jackie, you've been you've been really um, proactive about kind of real time monitoring. Um, Right. So, so I was going, this is Jackie James Creedon from Tonawanda. Um, I do remember seeing when the Harvey hit Houston is that uh, we've worked with Denny Larson and he went um, in that area and he, you know, he took a couple bucket samples. So I'm not sure what he found, but I do know that he was on the ground and taking samples with the bucket. Um, and that's a device that obviously we used here in Tonawanda mm -hmm. that worked really well. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we also are looking at our soil sampling toolkit as more of a post mm -hmm. um, disaster response kit to collect data. You know, when the flood waters recede, um, what is the contamination left um, mainly in the high exposure areas like gardens, clay areas. Mm -hmm. um, things like that. We have we don't have as much experience with water testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I know that you also um, you you had something in place where where folks were reporting on um, smokestacks and maybe maybe odor also. Oh right, yes. I forgot about that. That was our latest <laughs> campaign. Um, yeah. And when Tonawanda Coke was spewing out uh, sooty smoke from their smokestacks, um, people were complaining, but you know, we just had people take photographs and post them on social media with the dates and times. And uh, that worked really well because that caught the attention of the, uh, the state agencies and they actually used our photographs and you know, the prosecuting of the company. Mm -hmm. So, so not not just the tools, but the campaign as well. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's great. Um, right, and that's what it's about. It's about using both of them together. Right. Not, I mean, the data alone is not, you know, nearly as effective as that. You know, you have to marry that with a campaign. Mm -hmm. And and with the with the smug sex stuff. You were you were collecting photos. Were you also collecting um, any sort of data about air quality at the same time, or or no? Uh, um, yeah, actually, we did. Uh, the New York State DEC provided us with some SUMA canisters, okay. and we took a couple of we took a couple of those canisters as well. Um, they didn't really show anything, but mm. um, in conjunction with that, and then they were out with a 
24-7 benzene monitor. So, oh, you know, it really, it really was a joint effort between the state agency and the community group collecting data. Okay. Cool. Um, and I know <clears throat> there's some, <coughs> some, some folks throughout the public lab community that have been convening online over, over different kinds of air quality sensors or, or tools. Um, wondering if there, is there anyone here? We've, we've had some folks in the mix with working with purple air and I think somebody has recently um, sent out some, some how-tos for a DIY version of that. Um, Jackie, I think you mentioned, you know, the, the bucket, there are bucket brigade bucket. Um, is there anything else that folks can think about? Um, you know, either either badges, off the shelf stuff, um, DIY methods. Um, I definitely have questions about um, <clears throat> like if if there's sampling uh, that may contain um, volatile substances. Like how do we store them? Like when, like maybe our refrigeration is is not available, and and the mail's not running. Um, I know that's like that's like the dose straight into the weeds, but um, I have some of those type of questions, or like um, even neighborhoods that may be well off, and they're like, oh, we've got sensor nets everywhere, but then like, you know. I don't know, maybe, maybe their, um, their network connection goes down or something like that. Um, I, guess, um, I guess I'm really interested in failure. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Hey, Eduardo. Oh, hey, Eduardo. Oh, hey. hey Can you give a Eduardo, do you want to, do you want to say hi and just say a little bit about yourself and where you're calling from for folks that are on the call? Um, me? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Eduardo Luna. I'm from Houston, Texas. I'm a community organizer for the Northeast side of Houston, Texas. Nice to see everyone. Awesome. And, and Eduardo, just to, to catch up a little bit, we have, um, I see that you're probably on a phone or something, but we have a link to some notes that we'll share out. But right now we're just talking about methods for collecting data when there's been sort of an environmental issue, either before, during, or after, after a disaster. So we've been talking a little bit about um, air quality and, um, and yeah. And then so we had Greg just join. Oh, Greg. <laughs> Greg, also welcome. Um, Hi. Uh, do you want to just say hello and give a quick introduction? Hi there. My name is Greg. I uh, I lead the Open Referral Initiative, um, which works with organizations that refer people to health, human, and social services. Awesome. We work to build interoperability between the systems that connect people to resources. And uh, I met several of you lovely people at the barn raising in Newark, uh, and I am hoping to join for the barn raising in Houston. I actually have a pilot project with the 211 in Houston that may be kicking off over the next month or two. So cool. it's actually really, really good timing. Cool. Excellent, excellent. Um, and, and actually, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, um, and Jackie, when you were, or no, Liz, Liz was talking a little bit about um, taking and, and keeping samples when, you know, when you're perhaps juggling a couple different um, challenges. Danielle, not to call you up, but I saw you kind of nodding a little bit during that. Is there anything that you can volunteer about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I think that's a great question, Liz. And I was thinking, like, um, yeah, I think that an understanding of, you know, as, as came up earlier in the call of um, what contaminants tend to be present, um, given, you know, industry in the area, given the type of um, disaster or, or storm event that happened, um, and given some of the environmental conditions, it might sound kind of daunting, but um, I think if you don't 
like, because with volatiles, right, you'd want to have them, like, airtight, on ice, and, like, sent out in within 48 hours, but if you can't do that in a disaster situation, I think there's still a lot um, we can sort of guess or, like, assume, and then just keep it in mind, like, people's health is the most important priority, protecting people's health. Like, we, I think there's a lot we can go on, just being like, okay, it was a, you know, like, it was jet fuel um, in a cold, fast moving river. Let's, you know, get people, especially like elderly folk, you know, like, I think there's a lot we can assume, we can assume and learn. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it would be cool to have, yeah. Anyways, that's my first, my first thought. And then just thinking about like practically what resources or like trainings, um, could we have, could we try to build in communities so that people do kind of have that sense of what to do right away, even if you can't like actually take it, like as some folks mentioned, it's like the soil testing and like that piece is a bit later on almost. It's maybe not mm -hmm. the first priority in, a, in, a, in an event. Yeah, thanks for um, engaging with that. <laughs> My random question, Danielle. Um, <laughs> I. I was starting to think about um, that for whatever set of practices could be called a, a community science disaster response toolkit, there might be the health and safety section and then aspects of that that relate, you know, what health and safety considerations do you have when doing monitoring? And there might be a monitoring section that could have, you know, okay, continuous monitoring, um, photographic kind of evidence type monitoring because we still know that's what's holding up in court the best um, and then uh, sampling sample collection which is where my question came from and then I was thinking okay so health and safety monitoring and then a third bucket maybe remediation because like as soon as something happens we see like everyone's like okay I want a DIY water filter and there's all this there's this whole other realm of environmental engagement that is also unknown um, and I just wonder if anyone wants to like, you know, snap back against like, oh, hey, would these be like three buckets that we could work with or what else? Well, I think we have to also, hi, this is Jackie again. I think we also need to keep in mind, um, you know, as this event is happening or right after the event, um, people aren't really thinking about taking data. I mean, they're thinking about their health and safety, right? So I think that uh, the idea of maybe collecting data comes in a little bit further along in the remediation phase. Um, that's, those are just my thoughts. Yeah, I, I want to mention something that uh, we were doing here in El Salvador. Um, I'm doing a project on violence prevention, but uh, in order to do mapping, we designed a card game and we had pre-designed like sampling uh, places, like uh, places to do probe on what people thought had some hazards and some of them have to do with social violence, but some others had to do with some other environmental issues. And we could uh, make a, like a little assessment in around an hour with lots of data from a group of 10 to 15 people I could have over a thousand observations so that I would like to uh, maybe later show you some of that uh, and that could be like a methodology that can be used to have like an initial uh, you know like a, an idea of what are the main problems in the community and then use that so you can do the sampling more uh, advanced uh, gathering of information in the second phase Yeah, that, that sounds really good. And, and just, um, just sort of a, a note on the time, we're about 10 minutes out from, from the hour. So, um, so yeah, uh, we, in, in, in thinking about um, our, our toolkit, whatever, whatever it ends up being, um, what we want to do is, you know, we want to bring stuff to experiment with so that, you know, um, when, you know, when something comes up, if you anticipate that, that you know, someday Houston is going to 
Houston Galveston is going to kind of be dealing with another another big storm. Um, you know, what what things what things are helpful to have had in place so that when you're in that moment thinking about evacuating and and thinking about um, you know moving yourself to a safer place that that you know you're not you're not making a plan from scratch at that point to also be attentive to to the environmental issues um, so so yeah um, does anybody you know thinking thinking about you know, a set of tools and methods and sort of planning um, as, you know, in, in the sense of a toolkit. Is there, what, is there stuff? Oh. What if we have um, some data collected before the uh, actual events already ready for when we everyone gets here to be, um, and different sets of samples somewhere, someone, someone, someone could be from the bayou, someone could be from a, a ditch, different things, different places and stuff too. Now, the only thing we don't have is the actual thing that you put it in or what what, what, what what can we put it in to actually have it stored for when everything's coming? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I think that that's something that we can um, do a little bit of planning around. So, okay. you know, like folks said, you know, some stuff is going to need to be refrigerated. Some stuff may not last very long. Um, so, you know, thinking about what it is that you are, you know, what it, we can even look at those maps to sort of get an idea of what we think may be present that we'd want to test for and, and maybe work from there to figure out the sampling method and tools. So that's great. Um, you know what I'm wondering if we could do as we wrap up the call? Um, just do a round robin and just give everyone the floor for a minute. Yeah. So like say what's on the top of their head and send us off in good order. Yeah, I think I I think that is a great idea. Um, there, we're, we're, we're actually a pretty big call today. So um, I think if we're going to wrap by the hour, we can start now. Um, if everybody think wants to ping in for, I would say, you know, a minute to just share, you know, any, any other thoughts about sort of disaster planning or toolkits, um, I will go around given the order that I, I see folks. And if you want to be just held for later um, to say pass and we'll come back to you. So um, Danielle, do you have any any wrap up thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to say hi Eduardo. I think that's an awesome idea and I'd love to like what like help make that happen if you want. Um, okay. figure out how to get some soil tests and stuff done before yeah. like now so we can like cooking so show for the event for the barn raising so i'll i'll try to connect with you about that all right and nice to meet all of you really great ideas appreciate all the work y'all are doing great and we'll, we'll follow up and put everybody in touch after the call um sean yeah and you know i got a survey so okay yeah we do have a survey sean mcginnis sorry yeah <laughs> um i think there's a lot of really good ideas and i like the the different perspectives and views that we're looking at it. We're looking at it from a tactical response perspective. We're looking at it from a pre-planning perspective. We're looking at the uh, longer term um, allocation or equitable distribution of services afterwards. Um, I I'm personally think that given the breadth of the scope of all of this, it's a little difficult to kind of have a very focused conversation. And I think we may have to kind of set up guardrails and kind of yeah. think in certain channels around the different factors and components that we're talking about. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Leslie? Um, I'm not sure if food was already mentioned, but I was pretty horrified. Um, Eduardo, you might remember when they held up that FEMA box of what was actually in that box for food. Yes. And I thought yes. it would be so fun to actually make a listing for what you would really like to see in that box. So that, that would be one of the things I would like to do at that event. Like what, what could people themselves it. gather and make their own box and make that box a kit for themselves? That'd be real, really, really good right there. I like that. That's very good. Great. Um, we could definitely work on that one. <laughs> Excellent. Jeff? Um, yeah. I'm going to pass and just listen to what other people have to say. Thank you. All right. Liz, anything for you? Okay. Ashley. 
Yeah, just going back to the three buckets that Liz offered, um, I think that that makes a lot of sense having like the health and safety, but then the monitoring, we were talking about like a pre-monitoring and then a post-monitoring after the disaster. So that could be like two separate buckets, so maybe um, separating those two out. And then remediation or um, either remediation or what you're going to use that data and monitoring to do. So is it, you know, you're taking someone to court or whatever. So in each of those kind of like, what is the data that needs to be collected for each? And that's going to be different depending on the type of disaster, right? And, you know, the location, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know, I was almost envisioning like this um, spreadsheet of like, you know, these three buckets and a list of different disasters and different like toolkits or whatever. Um, so that's, that's what I'll end with. This was a great call. It was really nice to hear everybody's thoughts. Excellent. And we can get those spreadsheets up momentarily. <laughs> um, Eduardo, any, any last thoughts? Yes. Um, do, um, do we have any social media pages besides Facebook, like Instagram or anything like that? We, we will, yeah. We don't okay, have as many, uh, Public Lab doesn't have as many followers as you, Eduardo. <laughs> Oh no! Oh no! I mean, I didn't mean that. That um, cause I've been wanting like to share links on my um Facebook, and I wanted to be able to send them to all social media platforms that they have too, so they could be able to actually sign up too. Oh, well, last question: What's the age group of of the kids participating in this? Um, all all is just really. Generally, most of the people who attend barn raising are adults, but you know, younger people yeah. are often there as well. So, mm -hmm. we, I think we don't actually we don't have like a formal age group or anything like that. But it, they, these tend to be um, tend to be mostly adults, more, more adult group. But if you're okay, interested cool. in sort of working with younger people, we should we can definitely talk about that. Okay, because I was thinking about bringing a group of kids with me on this trip. Cool. Oh, yeah, that's certainly okay. for, for the Sunday the Sunday outing. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely. And they're, and they're high school kids. Just, the, um, Sunday I'll have little kids, but for, but like these are high school kids who are yeah, interested in. That's, that's plenty of fun. Yeah, high school kids, I think they'll, they'll okay, get right in. No problem. Um, so say. That's it. Thank you so much. I love all y'all. All right. We love you. <laughs> okay, I, I would I would add the I posted in the chat the uh, Ushaidi reflections on the the IT crisis. The platform, the Ushaidi platform. I don't know if you know it. Mm -hmm. For crisis, uh, for fast putting a survey online so people can can say if they get clean water or not clean water if they got electricity or not. I know these uh, online things are in crisis events are maybe there's no no COVID, there's no there's no internet and there's no data, but for, for the places where it is, it can be set up some kind of survey that people can can feel and and, and, and a little bit uh, to have this uh, real time data from the people affected and. and that. Cool. Great, thank you. Um, Greg. Hi, I'm sorry I had to join late, y'all. Um, so, and I took a look at the notes, but I don't know if this was already discussed. Um, the the work that I do, which deals with you know health, human, and social services, like where are the services? Um, yeah. I wouldn't normally consider it science. It's certainly related to health and safety, and certainly recovery, but it's it's mm -hmm. very different from the question of like how do we improve the monitoring of environmental you know factors. Um, there, there, so I guess I'm looking to you all for guidance. You know, there, there is real live, even local work that could be done around this issue. Um, but I also am very mindful of the challenges of focus and so on. So, you know, help, help me build the guardrails. Uh, and, and also if we would just want to like keep these separated, that's, that's fine too. Um, so maybe I'll follow up with somebody here afterwards to think this through. I got you, Greg. Yeah, and, and we'll have bandwidth to talk about a lot of different things at, at barn raising itself. You know, this, we're, we're focusing on some specific things, you know, in this call here, but um, there'll be room to do a lot. So, um, Dan. 
Uh, the only thing I would have is that uh, uh, I'm coming from a Red Cross perspective more than anything else. That uh, we would really probably find it useful to have uh, pictures that are uh, geocoded or a GPS location uh, that was readily available, uh, showing actual uh, disasters, you know, flood levels or mm -hmm. fire lines or something like that. So great. Thank you. Um, Brian? Hello, am I working? Yep. Okay, hi. Uh, I just want to say that I'm extremely impressed with the work you all are doing from both the civil society and science combined point of view and how absolutely necessary it is considering of government institutions we're facing with the EPA today. And my only regret is that you guys are far, far more known. I mean, you're unsung heroes to a great extent to what's <laughs> actually happening in most mainstream society. So you guys really should be out there more. Um, the work you're doing, I think, is absolutely essential, especially when you consider the kind of things we've had in California, the wildfires uh, and other problems and other things that are going on. So just I want to say thank you. Um, thanks, so thanks so much, so much Brian. Brian. And actually, um, <coughs> I've been on the I've phone, phone trying to connect, connect with some people, people in California. In California. Are, there are there any emerging community leaders having um, recently responded to the wildfires in California that you may know of? Liz, I'm sorry, there's actually... Um, we're, looking we're looking to do outreach to that set of people. Hey, uh, there's uh, a lot of echo on the line. I, I'm, I actually wasn't able to hear that. Uh, could, it could be... Could folks um, maybe mute for a second? Sorry, it's probably on. I tried to interrupt you halfway through, but I, if you just say it one more time. Okay, yeah, no, I just wanted to um, thank you, Brian, for that over overly executed praise. I do appreciate it, and also, but I'm so glad to hear from um, California here because I've been trying to reach out and identify maybe you know who who was an emerging community leaders in wildfire response. Um, we, we have mostly a, a storm-based um, coastal city um, flood response um, group engaged so far, but, um, you know, in terms of like the Southwest and the West, um, fire response is huge and, and there's a long like tradition of it. Anyway, so if you know of any kind of people who are, who are kind of mobilizing from a community perspective, um, now, as climate conditions change, um, please um, let me know and I can do some outreach. Thanks. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know anybody like that. What I'm mostly aware of is the failure of PG&E and the problems they're having. Uh, and also the lack of planning that went into the city of paradise and the uh, unintended consequences or intended consequences that came of that. Um, particular people trying to rise up and sh see what happens. Uh, I haven't seen that as of yet, but I'm sure there are some out there. I have a suggestion to um, media. The way what I did notice was that we didn't have no nobody. Um, like recording or anything, pictures or anything taken besides ourselves. You think we can have somebody there? I have a good friend who will come volunteer his time to come actually record us, take pictures and stuff like that, to do all these things for us, if that's okay with y'all. I can't hear them, let me see. Sorry, sorry. Um, we'll, we'll connect about that a little bit. Usually we have sort of an informal group tasked with with that kind of thing, but um, this this particular event, we may have some different guidelines around media, so we'll, we'll okay, good. again. Okay, perfect. Um, cool, cool. And uh, yeah, all right. So, um, Emilio, any 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 last thoughts? All right. Yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, Amelia, if you can hear us, we're your thinking audio about is... timeline to think about what okay. can are these kids, uh, you know, in, 
is bad. Hello. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Sorry, Amelia. We can't we can't hear you, but we will reach we'll reach, <laughs> we'll, we'll reach out after the um, Oh wait. Now you're here. Hello. Hi. <laughs> sorry, Amelia, I'm sorry. The, the audio really isn't isn't coming through. So I think we'll have to um uh if you want to share, if you want to share anything via the chat, we'll 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 shout it out to folks. Um, and uh, Sean, are you still here? Okay. Um, that 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 looks like everything, and we are just just over the hour. Um, this this meeting will will post the we'll post a video of it to the barn raising page. Um, at some point in the next few days, and we'll send out notes. Um, what I'm going to do is all the stuff that folks have been mentioning and suggesting. Um, I'm going to start that on our disaster response toolkit wiki, so um, people can kind of jump into that. And if there are things that we started talking about this afternoon that folks are really excited to talk about in person. We have another call tomorrow. It's our open call, so it's a less structured. Um, hour just to talk about anything that we want to talk about. So that is at 2 p. No, it's at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Um, there, there's a note. Um, there's a note in the chat, and um, you can find it on the public site website. So we can pick any of these conversations up either there or or on the website. However, however, easier. so. Um, Thanks everyone for coming. This was a really great hour, and I'm so excited that we got to hear about so many different perspectives. Um, we definitely have some direction in terms of planning for, for our, our various toolkit tables for Houston. And um, we'll be checking in with a bunch of you uh, after this to get things in a row. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And while we are at barn raising, Chose will be celebrating a birthday. So. What? Have fun. Bye, everybody. <laughs>